I'm, if I can find my device here, uh, I'm Neil Averett. I'm from the Federal Trade Commission in Washington. Um, I've worked on these issues there for 35 years or so. Um, let me note for the record, though, that what I'm about to say today reflects my own thinking and is not necessarily the official view of the Federal Trade Commission. Um, we've heard during the course of the day uh, a number of propositions about how the consumer choice approach might help us apply competition law better with better results and a more rounded, wiser scope for application. What I'd like to suggest now today is a second proposition for your consideration, and that is that the consumer choice model also helps us apply consumer protection law and will help us not only apply that law better, but will draw interconnections between it and competition law in ways that will make each of them more effective and wiser in their application. <clears throat> My main thesis is in the points that are on the board now. It's that competition and consumer protection law are two functions that are intimately related through an understanding of consumer choice. Uh, that they carry out the two functions that are needed to sustain a market economy that is based on choice in the following way. Uh, competition law protects the array of options in the marketplace. And we can talk about exactly how many options you need, but it's in the role of protecting options. Then at that point, consumer protection law steps in and it protects the ability of buyers in the marketplace to review the options and to select the one that fits their needs the best and to make that purchase. And these are the two functions that are needed for the effective exercise of consumer choice. These are intimately related functions. Uh, that's a very, very simple thesis. However, as we'll see, it has a number of important and actually kind of far-reaching implications. And I'd like to outline those in the minutes ahead in accordance with the outline you see here. Uh, first of all, defining consumer protection law in a little more detail. Then discussing in a little more detail how it relates to competition law within the framework of consumer choice. And then turning to some of the practical implications um, of this interrelationship. How seeing the two bodies of law in combination sometimes makes it possible to devise or to see the appropriateness of new theories of action and new theories of liability, how it also makes possible new and different remedies, and then finally how it has some practical administrative benefits for the actual conduct of administrative agencies. Let's start with the beginning. Uh, what is consumer protection law? Uh, basically, consumer protection law is the body of law that's about the process, protecting the process of choice. Um, we've become somewhat aware of the range of consumer preferences uh, through a choice approach to competition law. A choice approach to competition law basically raises the profile of non-price competition, makes us aware that consumer demands are multifaceted and complex. They go beyond simple price and quality, and they go into factors like variety and innovation. And my colleague, Elizabeth de Gellink, uh, pointed out that good economists have tools for reaching variety and innovation and other more complex aspects of choice. Uh, in the discussion, perhaps at the end of the meeting, I want to suggest that although those tools are theoretically available, in many, many important cases, they just haven't actually been used. They're too complex, they're too subtle, and in practice, the economists forget about them and assume them away. And one of the purposes of the consumer choice model is to raise the profile of these matters so that we don't forget them. It's not saying that a good economist can't deal with them. Um, then, uh, okay, so if consumers have that range of demands, they normally express those demands through their ability to choose, their ability to go into the market, identify the product that suits their needs, buy that, not buy the other one. However, that process, that corrective process, can be undermined by a number of seller techniques that are aimed at thwarting effective consumer decision making. And these techniques can include deception, um, coercion, various other distorting techniques. And consumer protection law is the body of law that's aimed at preventing the use of those techniques. 
Uh, deception is probably the clearest example of a consumer protection violation. A consumer is not going to be able to protect his or her interests or make the right kind of choices if the consumer doesn't have accurate information to begin with. And, the, and deception can be a way of giving inaccurate information. And it can take a number of forms. For example, there can be an explicit falsehood. You know, our medicine will cure your thinning hair. That might lead someone to make a wrong choice. Or there can be a false implication. You know, do you hate your thinning hair by our medicine? That doesn't actually say the medicine will cure the thinning hair, but it implies it. Or there can be a half-truth. You know, many users of our hair medicine have no bad effects at all from it. <laughs> might have, but others might. Or there can be implications from silence. When people say, gee, I assume your medicine is wonderful, and you just smile and say nothing. Um, there are other forms of harm to decision-making also. Uh, Another form involves the withholding of essential information. You know, if consumers are going to go to the market, protect their interests, they need certain kinds of really essential information about basic product characteristics. How well does insulation insulate? What's the octane rating of the gasoline? Does a product have some hidden health or safety hazard? Um, now, there are going to be very difficult questions about how far that rule ought to go, where you ought to draw the line, what kinds of disclosures should be required. And the modern tendency now may be uh, in the direction of uh, triggered disclosures, where a company is required to make disclosures only if it's initially made a claim that pr puts a certain product characteristic into contention in the first place. Um, but that's really a detail. The point is that there are certain kinds of really key information that are needed for consumer choice. And then finally, there's a question of coercion. You know, a consumer, an effective consumer choice can't be one that's absolutely literally constrained. And that doesn't happen that often, but it can happen. Uh, sometimes the constraints are psychological, you know, a sales technique that's really overbearing in light of the uh, standards of a particular culture. Or physical, simple physical coercion, uh, which doesn't happen often, but it can happen. Um, in the United States a few years ago, we had a case involving the Holland Furnace Company. Uh, Holland Furnace made home heating furnaces. And in November, they would, when the weather was getting cold, they'd send salesmen around door to door and offer to give uh, uh, free safety inspections of the homeowner's furnaces. And the sales rep would go to the basement, look at the furnace, take the furnace apart for inspection, then go upstairs and say to the homeowner, you know, it's terrible, but I found a safety problem with your furnace. And my ethical standards don't allow me to put your furnace back together in this unsafe condition. Uh, <laughs> but I can sell you a new Holland furnace. <laughs> and uh, at that point, the homeowner is faced with winter coming on and his furnace in little pieces on the floor and felt constrained. That was a simple physical constraint on a purchase decision. Okay, so that's the basic concept, and consumer protection law is intended to protect those things. Okay, how does that relate to competition law? Um, the basic relationship there is uh, simply functional. Um, the role of the FTC, um, probably of most other trade regulation agencies, is to protect a market economy. And the consumer choice model suggests to us that a market economy really requires two things. A sufficient array of options in the marketplace, and there's room for discussion about what array is sufficient, but a sufficient array in the marketplace, and then an ability to go into the market and select among those options. And those two functions really define the competition and the consumer protection missions. So the consumer choice model helps us define those two areas of the law. Competition law is in the business of protecting the sufficiency of the market options. So it protects price options by saying there's no price fixing. It protects supplier options by saying there can't be customer allocation or market division. It protects the options in terms of variety or innovation by saying there can't be anti-competitive mergers. At that point, it's done its work withdraws from the field, and consumer protection law takes over. And consumer protection law protects buyers' ability to make choices. Or uh, 
as Mr. Zimmer pointed out, in a flip side, sometimes it's protecting the sellers. Um, uh, focusing on the buyers, though, it protects their ability to choose on an informed basis by prohibiting deception, and it protects their ability to choose in the sense of making a free selection by banning coercion. You can also express this relationship in economic terms, it's the same relationship, to say that the consumer choice mission is intended to address all forms of market failure. And some market failures exist in the external market, and that's addressed by competition law. Other market failures exist inside the head of the buyer, affecting the buyer's ability to process information, and that's the business of consumer protection law. Now, why does this matter? The most important benefit from understanding the relationship between competition and consumer protection law, sorry, let me re rephrase that. The most frequently encountered benefit is that it lets us draw a clear line between the two bodies of law. It says, this is competition, this is consumer protection. This involves options, this involves the ability to choose among options. That lets you classify your cases correctly identify the right legal theory, marshal the relevant evidence, tell a con clean, convincing, relevant story. Um, in some minority of cases, though, you have the interesting result that both competition and consumer protection theories may be relevant to a particular situation. And that's going to come up only in the minority of cases, but they're very interesting because they open new vistas, they open new doors, they suggest new ways of doing business. For example, sometimes a consumer protection violation can be a tool for a competition uh, problem. A firm may engage in deception as a means of achieving monopoly. Uh, a technology firm may lie to a standard-setting organization about its patents and its royalties, persuade the organization to adopt its technology, that gives it uh, market power, which you can then use to exercise and charge a monopoly price. And that was the core of the Commission's allegations against Rambus and Intel. Another way that both theories can be relevant is, is a matter of reclassifying. Um, sometimes a matter, a kind of problem that we've approached and wrestled with as a competition problem and found really difficult, we can realize, hey, this is actually a consumer protection problem. And then you can reclassify it in those terms, and sometimes it becomes a lot easier. And it becomes easier sometimes by producing a new theory of liability or by producing a new kind of remedy. Let's start with the new theories of liability that might come up. Sometimes you can take what had been a really difficult, really intractable competition case and look at it as a consumer protection case instead. Consider the case of deceiving a standard setting organization that I mentioned a minute ago. Um, you de company deceives the standard setting organization, the organization acquires its technology for use in the standard market power and monopoly prices result. To tell that story, you've got to prove the market power, you've got to prove the monopoly power, and that can be difficult, that was a problem in the Rambus case. And it raises the question, why bother? Deception is a violation in itself. If you show there is deception, why not just stop there? You know, that's all you gotta show. And that's a consumer protection violation. The company was deceiving the standard setting organization. Um, to, and conceptually, that's right. You know, market power isn't required for deception. Deception doesn't involve a market failure in the external market involves a market failure inside the head of the buyer. And to take that approach really requires only one conceptual leap, and that's the leap to looking at a corporation as a consumer, to seeing a corporation as a buyer in the market that's worthy of our protection. And I think the consumer choice model suggests that that's right. We're in the business of protecting a market process. It shouldn't matter what the identity of the market purchaser is. We should be protecting the process and not the purchaser. Um, let me give you another quick example of reconceptualizing matter as a consumer protection case. Consider a, 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 an extortionate patent litigation. 
company has a weak patent, makes a bad faith claim that someone has violated the patent, and it says, hey, I'll sell you a license to my patent for just a little less than it would cost you to defend a lawsuit against me. Now, that's really coercion. That's extortion. That's the Holland Furnace case, really. And that's a consumer protection case. You're coercing the purchase decision. Um, and market power is really not necessary. Um, because to engage in distortion, in extortion, you don't require market power. All that a firm really needs is the ability to impose costs and harms on the target. So again, seeing these as consumer protection cases and getting away from the need to show market power makes our life a lot easier. Um, now, market power is always helpful. If market power exists, if you know about it, if you can put that into the story, so much the better. You know, that tells a rounder, fuller, more convincing tale. But I want to suggest that that's not always necessary. Now, sometimes the reframing can go in the other direction. And you can take what looks like a, comp uh, a consumer protection case and play with it and realize you can actually effectively approach it. You can approach it more effectively as a competition matter. Um, like Bob Land, I know American examples more than European ones. This is going to be an American example that has some uh, quirky features of our law, and I'll just sort of gloss over those. Um, for a number of years, state regulatory agencies in the US said that op optometrists, uh, people who prescribe eyeglasses, needed to practice as sole professionals. They needed to have their own offices. They couldn't be in commercial settings or under corporate names. And the boards that put out these rules said that this was necessary for consumer protection to protect consu prevent consumer harms. The FTC looked into that empirically and concluded that those claims were all bogus. There were no consumer harms. So it initially tried to address those issues in the terms in which they'd been presented. We said, no, there's no consumer harm. These rules are consumer protection violations. We're going to challenge them on that basis. And that challenge failed for complex reasons, but the basic, the basic reason is the state boards putting out these rules weren't deceiving anybody. They weren't really making claims. They were just promulgating rules. Then, though, we began to realize that these matters could be reconceived as competition cases. The regulatory boards that were promulgating these rules were boards made up of members of the, of the profession. These were eye doctors who were putting out the eye doctor rules in the same way that doctors regulate medical boards. And this means that you have members, competing members of a regulated profession entering into agreements that they're going to restrict the options in the marketplace, restrict the kinds of practice that are offered. Um, that's an antitrust violation unless the board is properly treated as a government agency. And to do that, it has to have certain safeguards. Its decisions have to be reviewed at a higher level of the state government to make sure they're in accord with the public interest. And the Commission has decided a case recently involving the North Carolina State Board of Dentistry on those terms and concluded that the board didn't qualify for state action immunity. So it was simply a horizontal agreement and it was an antitrust violation. So what all of that meant is that a matter that first presented itself to the Commission as a consumer protection problem actually ended up being resolved as a competition problem. And that shows, again, the virtues of being able to look at competition and consumer protection as a single integrated mission. Oops. That mission also sometimes, or that, that notion of looking at things together can sometimes also provide new remedies for us. Um, sometimes a competition problem, it's clearly a competition problem, doesn't require a competition remedy. Sometimes you can come up with an informational remedy that improves decision making and that's the best way of solving your problem. Um, consider a, a tying case. Manufacturer of a machine makes a certain consumable product um, that uh, uh, it wants to have used in the machine. Um, it's a tie-in. It's an act of monopolization. Um, uh, but rather than addressing the monopoly power, one might call for information, require disclosures of the characteristics of products that would work well with the machine, and that would uh, in, in, encourage consumers 
to try the new products and new firms to enter the market. Finally, um, a consumer problem can sometimes be cured by creating more competition, by having disclosures and formats that encourage consumers um, to shop more aggressively and look more aggressively at other suppliers. Um, appliance energy using uses were, uh, were uh, are regulated by the, co the commission requires that energy use of major appliances be disclosed. Um, that's a pure informational remedy designed to address a, a question of essential product characteristics. But the remedy is put in, this, in specifically comparative terms, comparing how one product relates to another, and that encourages manufacturers to come up with better competitive responses. In other words, the consumer protection product uh, remedy leads to a competition. The consumer protection issue is remedied in a way that basically focuses on a competition response. Whew, okay. Uh, final slide here. Um, Practical benefits of seeing competition and consumer protection law together. It encourages coordination between the two staffs. It helps the people administering each law think more clearly by setting their law within the common context. Provides a richer set of theories and remedies. Provides a plausible midpoint for Atlantic convergence. It's economic enough for the Americans. It have an, takes account of enough other values to be acceptable to the Europeans. What could be nicer than that? <laughs> And then finally, it's something you can explain. You can go to the press, to the public, to the legislature, and say, we're in the business of protecting consumer choice. Everybody understands that. If you go to the, all those people and say, we're in the business of minimizing marginal costs, and so on, <laughs> nobody understands. Protecting choice, you get more support for your programs. Thank you very much. <laughs>